Well, we've built some really nice additions to the deck here in the Great British Woodshop, but you know what? I think there's one other piece I could really do without here. And to get some ideas for it, I went to Hewingdon Manor in Buckinghamshire. Benjamin Disraeli, who was Prime Minister twice in the second half of the 19th century, came here to Hewingdon in 1848 with his wife, Mary Ann. He came for the beauty of the place, the views over the valley to the hills beyond, and for the trees, which were a particular passion of his. And he needed a significant country estate if he was going to achieve his political ambitions. We're in the study, and it's pretty much as Desraeli left it in 1881 when he died. It's a cosy space, easy to heat, which is just as well because Desraeli hated the cold. Now this piece is called a bobbin turned chair and it was made especially for Desraeli right here locally in High Wycom, when High Wycom was the center of the chair making industry in Great Britain. And this is called a traveling writing desk and he used this at school when he wrote with a quill pen. It's hinged in the center, it folds up with a little handle and that's how he would have carried it to school. And I'm told that he used this right up until his death. And this is the dispatch box that he used when he was Chancellor of the Exchequer. Now I'm always fascinated where terms come from and I found out that the term Exchequer actually dates back to the 1100s when they used the checkered tablecloths in the treasury to pile up the money on the squares and that's how they did the accounting. So Exchequer comes from checkered tablecloths. Now, Queen Victoria is a prominent presence here in the dining room and she and Disraeli had enormous respect for each other. She was quite a tiny woman and when she came here to visit in 1877, they actually had the legs of this chair cut down for her so her feet would touch the floor. Well, there's lots of things that I like about this sideboard. It has plenty of storage underneath and this surface on top is great for food and drink and it even has a very elegant cutlery storage. Now what if you wanted a fine piece of furniture that had all of these features but for outdoor use? Well here's what I've done. I built a serving trolley. Now the handle doubles as a towel rail and my cutlery tray isn't quite as elegant as the one at Hewenden but it is functional and it's adjustable to allow for different length cutlery. And because this project's going to sit outdoors all year round I drilled some holes in the bottom to allow for water to drain out. Now the top section is tiled and that'll be a great place to store all your hot dishes and carve up the meats. And the tray is removable, which is great for loading it up at the barbie and serving all your guests. While it's out, there's more storage on top. And underneath, there's plenty of space for all the salad bowls and plateware. Well, this project is gonna take two programs to complete. Now, when I built the original, I was pretty happy with how it turned out, but there's a couple of changes I could make that would make it even better. Where these side pieces join the rails, I used a trench, and I didn't like the look of the top of the joint. Plus, I had to screw and plug in the end. So I'm gonna change these joints to mortise and tenon joints, and that'll give a much nicer finish. The next thing I'm gonna do is thicken up these legs. They're plenty strong enough, but I think aesthetically that'll look a little better. And what's missing is a bottle holder, so I'll be building one of those. But first, we'll build the upper deck. Well, I must say, I do love power tools and woodworking gadgets of all kinds, but I treat them all with the greatest of respect, and you should too. The only time I ever take a guard off any of the tools I use is so you can see what I'm actually doing. It's an important safety feature, and you should otherwise always leave them on. Well, the first cut I'm going to make is to square up one end on the cross piece, and then I'll slide that squared end down up against my stop, and I've set the stop to 637. Then I'll square off the other end, and I'll do the same on the other three cross pieces. I've also cut the long rails to length, and these cross pieces are going to join the long rails with some mortise and tenon joints. And the first thing I need to do is mark a centre line on the cross piece, and to do that I'm just using a piece of ply that's 12.5mm thick, and on a 25mm wide board, that's obviously going to give me a dead centre line. And the other thing I need to do is to mark in 15mm from either end. And this is going to be the start and the end of the tenon. And I'm going to use these marks over on the jig. Well, I've set the piece so it just touches the bottom of the setup bar. And I just need to rotate this top plate around now until I get the setup bar lined up right over the top of the center line. 
a little tricky, and lock that in place. The next thing I want to do is move these sliding fingers. And these are the points that will determine where the ends of the tenons are. Now, this 16 mil mark here represents the cutter we're using, a 16 mil cutter, and I put that line over the top of the pencil mark and lock that in place, and I'll do the same on the left-hand side. Now, I've also set up a straight cutting bit in the router. I'm using a 22 mil collar, and I've set the depth of the cutter to 10 mil. Well, that's the last of the tenons cut. And now, I'm just going to take this top section off because the rails are 100 mil wide and this jig will only take a 50 mil wide board. Now, across here is the rail. And let me just spend a couple of minutes here showing you the mark out. This is the first cross piece and the second one here in between these two is where the removable tray will sit. Between this one and this one is where the tiles will be. And over here, the cutlery tray sits in there, and the handle will be up this end. Now, to cut these mortises, the first thing I did was mark a center line exactly the same as we did before, but instead of doing it on the end of the board, I've just marked it on the face. I've also put a pencil line here where I want that mortise to start. And I'm using the same principle as I did before with the setup bar. But this time, instead of holding it in place with those little screws, I'm just going to clamp it to the board but the principle is still the same. I slide the bar up so it's over the center line and line it up with the pencil mark and the 16 mil indicator mark. And now I can just clamp that and we're set up to make the mortise. With a bit of luck. Yeah, that fits just great. Well, I'd love to take all the credit for that, but with the jig, it really is that easy. Now, I've got seven more mortises to go. I'll cut them exactly the same as I did that one. Well, I'm going to cut a trench between these two mortises, and that'll be to receive the plywood base that the tiles will sit on. I've set a fence up on the router so that the cut will be 14 mil down from the top, and I've installed a 12 mil straight cutting bit into the router, and I've set the depth to 10 mil. And I'll also make this cut in a couple of passes so I don't overload the cutter. And I'm going to make the same cut on two of the cross pieces. Now this trench is for the slats in the upper storage area and it's 10 mil wide and 10 mil deep. And that trench is going to sit 25 mil up from the bottom. Well here's what we've done so far. This is the trench for the upper storage area. This trench here is for the plywood base for the tiles and I'm about to cut two trenches in these cross pieces here and that's to take this piece of wood which is the cutlery tray and it'll slide in like that. Now this piece of wood is 10.5 mil thick. I've installed an 11 mil bit in the router table and I've set the height of it so it'll cut a 6 mil deep trench. Now the next thing I'm going to do is add some drainage holes to let water escape and I'm going to do that with a 10 mil brad point bit. Well, when I made the original cutlery box, I just had one divider either end. But now I think I'm going to put three either end, and that'll give me plenty of flexibility for different size cutlery. I've installed a 5.5mm bit in the router, and I've set the depth to 5mm. And I've also put a straight edge guide on the cross piece. Now I'm going to run this flat of the router up against the straight edge guide, and then I'll guide the bit all the way through until I break through into this trench. Now to make the next cut, I've reduced some setup time by making up this little scrap piece of wood. And the width of this wood is the same as the distance between the flat of the router base and the edge of the cutter. So I can bring this wood up to the line, loosen off the clamp, slide it up so that the wood lines up with the pencil line. Now when I make the cut, it will be right on the line. Now the next thing I need to do is to cut the recess for the removable tray. Now the first cut for that that I'm going to make will be 5 mil away from the edge of the cross piece and it'll go all the way across and the depth of this cut is going to be 60 mil. So I've raised the table saw up to that height. Now to make sure that both of these boards are perfectly aligned when I cut that recess, I'm going to slide both pieces up against the stop on my sliding mitre gauge and I'm going to add a clamp to make sure that they don't move. Let's see. Now that works. 
Oh, that's perfect. I've swung the boards around, and I've lined up the saw blade with the pencil mark. I've added a couple of clamps so it won't move, and now we can make that cut. Well, the next cut that I want to make is this long cut along the line for the recess. Now, to do that, I'm going to use the jigsaw, and I've installed a narrow blade in the jigsaw because I want a nice, tight radius cut in this corner. But the narrow blade means I won't get a terribly accurate cut as I follow along the line. So I'm going to stay a couple of mil proud of the line, and then I'll get that nice, flat, finished cut I want using the router. The bit I'm using in the router is a flush trimming bit, and this one has a ball bearing at the bottom and at the top. Now, these ball bearings ride along a template and they mirror whatever shape the template is. So we're using a straight edge template in this case to create a straight line. Now because you're not going to see this area underneath here, this is where the slats for the upper storage area are, I'm going to fasten this temporarily to the piece with a couple of brads. I couldn't get right up into the corner with the flush trimming bit because it would eat into this surface. So I'm just going to remove this last little bit of material with my profile sander. Now these are a handy little tool. The most sanding discs now come with a Velcro back, so they attach easily. And there's holes in this one to allow for the dust to be sucked up. And uh, they're just a great tool for getting into tight little corners. Well, when we come back, we'll finish the upper deck and then we'll start on the serving tray. Well, welcome back to the Great British Woodshop. Today's project is a serving trolley. In the first half of the show, we made a good start on the upper deck. And I showed you also on this original that there's a few places where I'd like to make some improvements. One of them is on these slats that form the upper storage area. And I'm going to add some chamfers. And I'll do that with a chamfering bit installed in the router table. Well, the next thing I'm going to do is to make a handle out of this square piece of stock. Now, you can't buy a Roco dowel off the shelf, so I'm going to make one. Now, you could do that a couple of ways. You could turn this down on a lathe, but I thought I'd show you an alternative on how to do it with the router table. I've installed a rounding over bit, sometimes called an overload cutter, and I'll run each corner through the router. Well, the next thing I want to do is add some shape to the end of these rails where the handle's going to go. And to do that, I've made myself a little cardboard template. And I can just line that up with the three edges and then use my pencil to just mark out the lines. And then I'm going to cut these out using the jigsaw. And I've still got that fine, narrow blade in the jigsaw because I want to get into these tight little curves, and these tight radiuses and then I'll clean it back to the line using the oscillating spindle sander. To make the hole for the handle, I'm using a Forstner bit. And the beauty of this bit is it gives me a flat base at the bottom of the hole. And I'm drilling the hole 10 mil deep. With the exception of the recess for the removable tray, which I want to keep nice and sharp, I'm going to round over all the outside edges of both rails with a 6 mil radius rounding over bit. Well, I'm about ready to assemble the upper deck, but before I do, I'm going to give everything a thorough sanding with some 120 grit paper in the random orbit sander. With the 6 mil rounding over bit still installed in the router, I'm going to soften this edge down here by the removable tray, and I'm going to do the same down on the other end where the handle is. Now, I had to clamp the whole upper deck assembly together so I could get the rounding over bit to go between these two boards. But I don't have enough space on the top of this board here to balance the base of the router. So I'm just going to lay this down flat and I can finish this off with the board flat on the bench. Now the reason Iroco and Teak are always used for outdoor furniture is because they're very oily and that makes them very resistant to water. Unfortunately, it also makes them resistant to glue. So to improve the bond in the joints, I always wipe all the joints down with a cellulose thinners. Now you could use any sort of thinner, like a mineral spirit or white spirit. They'd all work just as well. But I like cellulose thinners because it evaporates very quickly. 
Also, when you're using any of these materials, of these thinners, uh, it's a good idea to use them in a well-ventilated area. Now, this is part of the project that you can't waste any time on. I made sure that I set out all of these pieces in the right order, so I didn't have to think too much about it as I'm putting it in. It's a bit of thing to put some glue on the end of this. And this glue is a waterproof glue, which you really must use if you're building an outdoor project. Now the cutlery tray goes in without any glue down into those trenches. The next board to go in is the ply, and this is the base for the tile centre, and no glue on it either. This is part of the project I wasn't particularly looking forward to. I've got to get these seven slats inserted in this end, and there's no glue on these slats either because I want them to move, I want them to expand and contract out in the weather. So I'll be tacking those in place. And the reason I like to move so quickly is because once this glue goes on, you've probably got about five minutes before it starts to set up. And it's pretty much solid after about 10. Okay, now with that end engaged, I'm just going to hold this down with a clamp just so it doesn't separate on me later. And now comes the fun part. There's one. Oh, I got lucky. Now, normally I check for square by measuring diagonally from corner to corner, but I can't do that in this case because I've got rounded over edges up near the handle. So I'm just going to check it using the framing square. Now, it is extremely important, and that's fine. It's extremely important that this is square because if it isn't, when you put the tiles in, they won't fit and the grout lines will be all uneven. Now these slats will eventually get tacked in place from underneath and I'll space them out as well. But I'll do that after the piece is dried up. Well, when I built the original, I used 10 mil thick slats on this tray. And as the wood dried out a little bit, they tended to warp, at least one of them did. And I'm a bit worried that it might happen to the others. And a tray that's not flat is about as useless as an ashtray on a motorbike. So I'm gonna make sure that I put some tongue and groove joints in the next one and also use some 15 mil stock, and that'll make sure the tray is perfectly flat. Well, these are the two boards that form the ends of the removable tray, and what I want to do is cut a trench down the inside of both of them to receive the tongue and groove boards that'll form the base of the tray. I've set up the router bit in here, it's a straight cutting bit, and I've raised it so it's 10 mil up above the table. And I'm just about to set the fence, and to do that, I use this little gauge. The little ruler here slides back and forwards, and I can set that to 25 mil. And that's because the router bit is 15 mil wide and I want the cut to start 10 mil from the fence. So I can just slide the gauge up against the bit and then move the fence until the feet on the gauge are flush with the fence. And I can lock it down. Next, I want to cut the finger holes in the tray ends. And to do that, I'm going to use a 22 mil Forstner bit in the drill press. And I'm going to drill a hole down this end and one down here. And then I'm going to remove the material in the middle with the jigsaw. The beauty about these spindle sanders is that you can get different sized drums to pretty much suit any of your needs. The spindle sander does leave a little sharp edge around here, so I'm going to round the edge over with a 6mm radius rounding over bit. Well, Oroco is an interesting wood. It has plenty of variation in colour, in texture and in grain, and you never know quite what you're going to get until you cut into it. These are the boards that are going to make the base of the removable tray, and I'm just having a look at what I have here to work with. Take this piece, for example. It's very dark on one side, and on the other side, it looks like a completely different piece of wood. So I'm going to have a look for some color variation here. And I think by swapping a few of these around, I can create a sort of light, dark, light, dark effect, which I think is much more pleasing. 
Well, next I'm going to cut tongue and grooves in all of these slats. And to do that, I'm using a tongue and groove match lining set. The great thing about this cutter is that I can cut both the tongues and the grooves on the same cutter. And to change it over between the two, I just undo this nut, rearrange the components, and that'll cut both sides. Also, it chamfers at the same time. Now, anytime I'm running multiple pieces through, before I do it, I always make a test cut. And this is the test cut I made for this one. And then I keep these pieces as a template. And that gives me a quick setup time because I can just use it again to set the cutter at the right height. I've also installed a lead-in pin on here. And that's for safety. So I can then bring the work in under control and move it through the cutter. Well, I've changed this bearing for a smaller one, this one here, and added a couple of shims. Now I'm going to put this cutter on the arbor and a washer and a nut. And I can tighten that whole thing down. Also, it's a good thing with these cutters to make sure that the cutting surfaces are alternated. It lowers the stress on the cutter. I tighten that down. And now we can make the cuts for the tongues. Well, I'm very happy with how this tray has turned out. It's a real improvement over the original. And now I'm getting ready to glue it up. Now, because wood is a natural product, it's continually moving. In the case of these slats, they're going to want to expand this way. In the case of the end piece, it wants to expand this way, because wood always expands and contracts across its grain. Now, when I glue up, if I were to put glue all the way through this trench, I'm a little worried that the wood may split as it tries to move. So what I'm going to do is just put a dab of glue for each of the slats here in the trench. Each board also gets a single brad in the center, and that'll allow it to move without splitting. And this piece gets a bead of glue. I'm going to clamp it in place and just hold it there while I attach it ever so carefully with some more of those 20 mil brads. Well, we made a great start on the serving trolley. One last thing I'm going to do tonight is fasten these slats down. And I'm going to do that the same way as I did on the tray. In the next part, we're going to build the lower deck. Some wheels, feet, a bottle holder, and I'm going to tile this section right here. I hope you join us to see how it all turns out. I'm David Free, and this is The Great British Woodshop.